important moment in my life looking back on it because I'd never done a film before. And at the time, uh, having played Laertes to Ken's Hamlet at the Royal Shakespeare Company, um, I was, he'd commissioned me to write a film. And he said, have you ever been on a film set? I said, no, I just do theatre. And so he said, well, why not come along and observe? I can give you a tiny part and um, you can at least see how a film set works. So I owe him a great debt. And it was fascinating seeing him covering all bases. He, as you say, he not only um, <clears throat> produced and directed, he starred in it as well, and was a real force of energy. It was extraordinary watching him on set. <clears throat> and I learned a lot in that first experience. Um, obviously, you know, watching De Niro close up, I just, I only had a few scenes, but um, watching him, the way he worked and rehearsed and, uh, and the energy he gave the scenes, um, I'd heard things about Hollywood stars sort of once the camera's not on them, sort of switching off and going back to their trailer and getting a stand in. He was absolutely there for, for the reverse angles, um, you know, fully, fully dressed in his costume and giving, you know, a huge performance um, to encourage the other actor that he was speaking to, particularly in this case, I remember John Cleese. Um, so he was, uh, it was a great lesson, a great experience and, um, you know, um, uh, one that I will always cherish, yeah. And how did your experience with Kenneth Branagh like differ compared to what was he like as a director? Did it differ to how he was on stage with you? Well, you know, he's playing Hamlet, so and he was being directed as Hamlet. Um, I think what always has stayed with me is his unflappability. I mean, under especially when you think about you know trying to navigate a big budget film as it was in those days, um, <clears throat> and he had a lot on his shoulders. And and I've seen this with a couple of other directors, director actors. I've worked with uh, their sort of ability to trust the, the the other departments to do the best of their to give the best of their job, um, <clears throat> so that you feel that people are being delegated and, and given personal responsibility around a film set is really important, rather than a director who, who claims that he knows everything and knows about everybody's every department's job. Trust them, and they will give their best work. and And that was true also in, on the stage with him. You know, he was a terrific Hamlet and, and great to work with. And it always comes from the top. If you've got a person at the top who is treating others with respect and kindness. Nobody else can, you know, throw their toys out of the pram. So he was a great role model. Everyone would love to be in Bond, I'm sure. And you obviously got to have a small part in that. Uh, I wonder what do you kind of remember from that experience in particular? I can remember my agent saying there's a film called Bond 18, uh, which as it was imaginatively titled at the time. And so I went to meet Roger Spotters with the director and he said, "We're putting, I'm putting together the cast for this sequence at the end of the film where the Chinese Navy and the, and the British Navy are at loggerheads in the South China Sea. So I immediately had an image of myself in Thailand for three weeks lying on a sun lounger mm -hmm. and occasionally turning up for work. Not a bit of it, it was two days in a simulator in Portsmouth um, with a load of naval cadets who did, did the job of, of uh, barking out uh, mission commands far better than uh, we could. Would you ever consider going back to Bond in some way? Oh, it's such, I mean, it's such an iconic franchise. I mean, in, um, uh, goodness knows how they're going to reinvent it for the next generation, but uh, I've got a money penny in me. What sort of acting do you do? Films, mainly. Oh, splendid. Oh, well done. How's the pay in movies? Notting Hill is one of the all-time greatest rom-coms ever made, in my opinion, and lots of people's opinions, of course. Um, and you got to be in it as Bernie, which I think is one of your early roles where people described him as like, you know, a bumbling, likeable character that you have played since. Uh, and I wonder, do you have like a favourite time or a favourite moment on that set when you're there with Hugh Grant and Julie Roberts all that? It was a very happy time and I can remember every day of it with real, you know, vivid clarity. <clears throat> I think because it was a happy experience. Um, having a, a group of people led by, you know, Duncan Kenworthy, the producer, and Richard Curtis, uh, who wrote this glorious script, and uh, and Roger Michel, who was the late Roger Michel, who was such a wonderful director. I think I've got one particular memory. It's a scene that's not even in the film. It got cut um, of all of us walking down uh, Portobello, uh, in about six of us abreast, the group of friends. Um, and uh, and I remember there was a, a shopkeeper who started throwing eggs at us. They'd all been paid paid hassle money for the, having their trade interrupted for a few hours while we filmed. Nevertheless, this shopkeeper thought it would be hilarious to throw eggs. 
Um, he wasn't cross. He, he was just seemed to be, just thought it might be entertaining. But that's sort of the character of Notting Hill for you, really, uh, as a place. Um, but I do remember it from a, from a filmmaking point of view, is that after each take, Roger would come up to each of us and give each of us a note or an idea about how what we would deli- how we were delivering the lines or, or the rhythm of the scene, and he did it with such um, individual attention, so that the way he'd give a note to me would be completely different to the way that I don't know Gina McKee would take a note or Tim McInerney or Hugh Grant, and um, just had this great capacity as a director, having come from the theatre, of knowing how to pull the faders up and down on each performance, and um, that was a great thing to observe, and uh, it was a very happy shoot. And we've got to talk about Vicar of Dibley, like you were actually in one of Van's favourite episodes, the last episode, um, and I wondered what was it like to work with Dawn French, especially when she at the time is saying goodbye to such an iconic character. Uh, people forget that Vicar of Dibley's only got something like 22 episodes or something, 21 or 22 episodes, and uh, of course became so beloved and um, uh, the late and wonderful Emma Chambers was an old, old mate of mine from drama school and we'd been on Notting Hill together and obviously Richard had uh, created the show. I'd worked with Dawn before on a thing called Murder Most Horrid. Um, And I felt very honored to come into that uh, wonderful, beloved group of characters just for that last episode. Uh, and to play this sort of slightly dotty vicar um, who still had the hots for Dawn from from uh, uh, training college days. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in fact, one of my fondest memories was at the rap party, watching Trevor Peacock dancing with Emma Chambers, both of them now sadly gone, but uh, wonderful people. And, and again, you know, Richard created this, this great world that people wanted to visit once a week or as often as they could in, in those shows. So um, I think it was his ability to as he said, as he said, described it once, I, he was talking about a sitcom I'd been in, which was a complete failure. And he said, the thing is about Dibley is that people want to go to that village. And if you don't want, as an audience member, don't want to be part of that world, if you feel that you're you're not actually invited into that world and that you, you could imagine spending an evening with those people, then you're on tricky territory. And he was absolutely right. So it's not necessarily likability, which is that word that gets banded around a lot in sitcom, but there is a but you do want to spend time with these people in the in this place. And um, he created that magically. Uh, and, and Dawn, of course, inhabited that role so superbly. All I've proved is that Lord Grantham would like us serfs to stay in our allotted place from cradle to grave. There is only one thing I would like, and that I would like passionately. It is to see you leave this house and never come back. That show obviously has become one of the most beloved British shows here and abroad, obviously. It's absolutely massive. (laughs) I wonder, has it surprised you how viewers have connected with it so much over the years? It never ceases to amaze me and it did when it first started in 2010, I think it was, and um, here we are 14 years later, we're making a third movie and, you know, at least one of our producers said, well, don't, you know, it's never going to last beyond seven episodes anyway, so don't, you know, lose too much sleep about this. And here we are all those years later still together. Um, and what's been really interesting is there's a whole new generation of people watching it and, and still finding it engaging. Um, and also what's been rather touching, you know, particularly over the pandemic when people were, were stuck at home and, and they revisited a show that had finished, you know, five years before. Um, and uh, we've had lots of, each of us have had lots of letters from people saying, I used to watch it with my gran or my, uh, my son who's now married or my husband who's now passed on or whatever. And it had an emotional resonance um, for, for, for the period of time that it was on. And people find a comfort in it and, 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 and revisit it like a warm bath. Um, and I'm not complaining because it's been a, a wonderful part of my life and we're filming the third film at the moment. And it's a, it's a lovely, you know, coming together of people I care deeply about. And that's just the fictional characters. <laughs> and speaking of the third film, I really wanted to ask you, like, well, what can fans expect from uh, from the film? For my character, um, I think the usual, which is that he's a sort of um, uh, he's a sort of dinosaur trying to be led into the into the future, you know, reluctantly, and then eventually he stumbles forward a bit. So uh, as always, there's that rhythm of things changing with glacial slowness. Um, and Robert finally accepting that uh, things you know, it's time to, to, to move the story on, so to speak. Um, it, uh, it's got the it's got so you know the, the usual tropes, if you like, of um, thrills and sp- thrills and spills in a very Downton way, which means you know, spilling a teacup pretty much. Um, but uh, it's uh, I, I think you know people who've watched the show over the years and have loved it will um, will yes, while they'll miss Maggie Smith's presence. Uh, she doesn't step out of the shower um, and it's all been a dream. Um, it's, um, 
she is gone, but I think there's there's so much uh, warmth and, and and fun to enjoy, um, and new elements as well, which I won't spoil. Um, that I think it'll be it certainly be the you know the best iteration of the of the film versions yet. I wanted to ask about Maggie Smith because obviously that was such a pivotal moment in the in the last film year. Like, what was it like for you and your castmates to to bid farewell to her character in a way, who's just this incredible matriarch for the, this whole time? Yeah. It was. I mean, she sort of had three exits from the show. There was the, the, the funnily enough, the dining room, the final dining room scene felt like a, a farewell because we'd spent so many weeks in, in over the years in, in that room. Um, and then there was obviously her death scene and then there was her actual final scene, which was just a tiny little moment that I wasn't actually there for. But um, but the death scene really came home to me quite early on in the day because we took it took all day to film. That um, that you know, I, I was, it was the last time I'd properly have a scene with this woman who'd been my stage mum, as it were, my screen mum for all these years. Justice is often upsetting. I'd love to talk about Poirot as well because you got to be in arguably David Suchet's best episode as Poirot murdering Orient Express, which is one of my favourites as well of his. Um, I wonder what stood out to you most about that special and, and working with him on that. Uh, well, a his performance. I mean, uh, you know, he's legendary for 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 nailing that dialogue, as as, as you know, in so much, so much of the structure of those uh, stories is the denouement where he you know reveals how he knows who who done it, and he was a it was a masterclass in in technique and and uh, quite apart from simple line learning, you know, these great stretches of dialogue or monologue that he had. Um, and again, you know, leading from the front, his um, his courtesy to all the characters, all the actors on set was was fantastic, and and it was just a wonderful ensemble of people. You know, uh, we had you know Jessica Chastain, David uh, Dave Morrissey, Sam West, um, Toby Jones, a, a wonderful uh, array of British talent, um, and superbly directed by Philip Martin, I thought. Um, so I think it stands up there alongside any of the uh, the big screen Poirots that there have been. Speaking of the big screen uh, Poirots, I wanted to ask, would you ever be interested in working with your old friend Kenneth Branagh on his Poirot? Oh my goodness, I mean, I'd walk over hot coals to work with Ken, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, doctor, what's, what's happening to me? She can smell the blood on your skin. She's marked you for death. She, a demon, out there in the ocean. Um, and obviously, uh, Doctor Who, which um, you got to be in that in such a fun episode was Matt Smith. I wonder, you got to be a pirate of all things, which is such a fun thing to do in Doctor Who. Um, what was that like, especially working with Matt Smith, Stephen Moffat and Karen Gillan, who obviously are reuniting now in Douglas's council? Yeah, it was great. I remember we had a sort of read through and it was the end of one of, they were shooting a previous episode and Matt and Karen came in looking absolutely exhausted because those days on, on set, particularly for Matt and the energy he had to bring to the role, was absolutely, you know, punishing. Um, and uh, we did the we did a sort of rehearsal read through, and he absolutely again this his leadership and his energy was exemplary, um, and I realised then and there that I could never play Doctor Who because I'd never have that much energy or the capacity to retain so much, uh, you know, fantastical dialogue as as, as he did. Um, but Karen and, and, and Matt were wonderfully welcoming, and we went and did a, a few. I remember a few very cold nights filming on a ship down in, in Cornwall. Um, I think probably with rain machines and certainly with a bit of brandy at the end of the night to uh, try and keep us warm. But they were great. Uh, they were great hosts for a guest artist like me. London prides itself on its multicultural uh, multiculturalness. Uh, no, uh, that's, uh, prides itself on its multiculturality. It came at such a great time because obviously it was leading into the uh, 2012 Olympics. I wonder what was it like being part of a topical comedy series like that. It was quite interesting because there was a there was a a cynicism in the air that Britain was going to absolutely embarrass itself and not be able to do this. And so that was sort of the backdrop for 2012, the show, which was, uh, for those who didn't see it, it was a, it was a um, uh, my, my character was leading a team just at the level below Sebastian Coe, uh, who was try, you know, trying to administrate the organization of the games and what a, what a cock up it was going to be because of course Britain can't do this sort of thing. And so it became this fan, and of course, you know, those two weeks in August, and I was there. Um, I was there on Super Saturday. I got tickets in the ballot, and um, you know, it was probably the last time. And I mean this seriously. The last time I felt that Britain felt properly united, uh, and it was proud of itself for whatever that, you know, whatever, however you describe Britain, it was it was united at that point. And the pride of being in this city. Uh, in this country at that time was palpable. Even um, Danny Boyle, Danny Boyle apparently said, 
did you have cameras in our meetings? You know, because uh, he, I believe he took the box set away after, well after the event, he said he couldn't watch it during it. But uh, well after the event, he took the box set away and um, sort of cringed watching it, saying for some of it was too, too close to home. But we are fortunate enough to be sitting at the center of the greatest broadcasting organization, arguably one of the greatest ideas in the world. BBC, it, BBC. Yes, exactly. You returned for W1A, um, and it is the BBC kind of poking fun at itself uh, in a way. So I wondered, what was it like working on that, but also you and Jessica Hines leading a new ensemble cast in that? Uh, it's, it, it's all down to really the credit is all due to, to John Morton, who wrote and directed both uh, iterations. Uh, and he has a very particular writing style. Um, uh, I think unlike the thick of it, which as I understand it, Armando writes and they, and they shoot that and then they throw it open to improvisation so that the finished version is a sort of mix of uh, improv and script and, uh, and that gives it this freshness. Whereas John writes uh, absolutely like it's a piece of music and every um and er is scripted. So it's really, really hard to learn. And he'll, he'll just write yes or no, or yes, no, but. Um, uh, and, and there are so many different rhythms and every yes or no has a different meaning. And it's, it's very complicated to learn. And so we, so the, the cast of uh, 2012 had, had uh, as you say, morphed into, into W1A and Jessica Hines' character came too. And um, so this, the new cast, we, 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 you know, we all bonded again. And, and the way we bonded was that in, in between each scene, instead of going and sitting and having a cup of coffee and doing the crossword, we sat there running the lines, running the lines, running the lines, running the lines, because uh, it was filmed at such pace and with such a sort of delicate uh, scripted overlaps and that sort of thing that we didn't want to let John down. And um, so it became, we became a tight little, almost like a theatre troupe. Um, and we knew how to pick up each other's rhythms, but it was probably the most, it's probably the hardest job I've ever done. We have your sculptor, Sergeant Walter Garfield. He's a good egg. I worked with him on the World War One Memorial in St. Louis. Uh -huh. It'd be great to talk about the Monuments Men, obviously, with uh, George Clooney there <laughs> directing. I wondered, you know, what was it like to work with one of Hollywood's biggest stars? It was amazing. I remember the night before my first uh, scene, uh, I looked at the call sheet and it said, it read something like, you know, George Clooney, uh, Bob Balaban, Jean Dujardin, the Oscar winner for um, the artist, um, uh, John Goodman, Matt Damon, Bill Murray. I couldn't believe it, you know, six great icons just right there. And me. Um, and um, But of course, as soon as you get on a film set with actors, you, however big they are as star names, they're, they're just actors who wear underpants like you, or not. Um, and uh, so it was a it was a great experience. And, and George is is legendary as a director in the same way that Clint Eastwood is. He's just good to people, and um, and finishes early, which of course crews love. Um, you know, he'd always say, I've, "I've got that scene. We don't need to do any more on it." And um, uh, uh, and again, uh, like I was referring to earlier, you know, incredibly gracious and courteous to other departments so that you know you never felt he was bulldozing anyone and would uh, depend on on the skill sets of everybody on that set because we are fortunate in our industry to have amazing uh, talent uh, in all departments what's your name hmm? do bears even have names mm, of course we do my name is <coughs> beg your pardon <coughs> Right. You have to talk about one of my favourite films of yours, Paddington. I love, I love Paddington so much, and Paddington too, of course. Um, I wondered, you know, it's obviously such a beloved franchise, and Henry and, and Paddington have always got so many fun moments together for both films. But I wonder, what's your fondest memory of making that? Uh, well, actually, the one that's just popped into my head, and there are many, many, and, and including on Paddington Three as well. But the one that popped into my head was rehearsing the scene in the first film with Simon Farnaby and it involves him sticking a pin in my arm to see if I've got a false arm or not. And um, I remember saying to, to Simon uh, and to Paul King as we were rehearsing and we, uh, we were kicking the scene around a bit, I said, you can't, you can't start sticking pins in people. This is, a, you know, this is, this is going to get, give us a, give us an A rating, whatever you call it these days. And, you know, we, 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 youngsters won't be allowed to see it. There'll be a health warning and all that. And also, you know, it'll be a very unsettling for children to see pins being, and Paul King, get over yourself. Paul King says, get over yourself. Kids love grown-ups being hurt with pins. So, um, so it stayed in the movie and um, it, it's quite right. It's, it's, a, it's a glorious sequence. And obviously Paddington too. 
you got to reunite uh, with your Notting Hill co-star Hugh Grant, uh, which I feel like his character is such a far cry away from his heartthrob days, of course, deliberately so. Um, but I wonder what was that like to work with him on that and reunite with him in that way? We calculated it was 19 years since we've been in a rehearsal room together, so that made us both feel quite sort of um, senior, uh, I suppose. Um, and he's, it sounds deeply patronising coming from somebody who's younger than him, but he's, he's developed into this amazing character actor. Uh, everything from the, um, the Jeremy Thorpe role to uh, the gentleman uh, to, um, to his performance in this. And uh, he, was, it was, he was great. He grabbed it by the throat and, and really had fun with it. And um, some, of the, some of the funniest lines that he came up with that, 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 that are in the script or they're in the finished film are his. Um, and um, you know, he was a joy, a joy. And that, that dance sequence at the end um, was uh, absolutely fantastic. And they only, they took, I gathered yesterday, they only took one day to film it. Um, and uh, and he, you know, he was taught to tap dance and, and he pulled it off with such a plum and flair. Um, he, he was glorious in the film. I think he should have won an Oscar for it, but there we are. You obviously mentioned Paddington in Peru uh, there. So I wonder, is there anything that you can share about it? Because obviously we've just seen uh, the trailer, I think, a few days ago. The trailer's just arrived. And uh, so we've got uh, the, the, we've got wonderful uh, new, as it were, guest artists. Um, so um, Antonio Banderas is this um, Fitzcarraldo type adventurer who uh, runs a riverboat and takes the Brown family upriver. Um, and we've got Olivia Coleman as the uh, Reverend Mother who runs the Home for Retired Bears where we've all gone, uh, now that Paddington has his passport, to visit Aunt Lucy. But when we arrive, we discover that she herself has gone off on an adventure, so we must go and find her. So it's a quest to find Aunt Lucy. Um, and uh, it's glorious, it's full, of, it's full of all the fun and adventure that the, you know, the first two films had, and uh, as you'd expect, with enormous heart and a lot of marmalade. The higher you go, the better they hide. But they're villains all the same. I wondered, what was it like to work on a, like a true crime drama like that? Playing my character, Brian Boyce, was really interesting. Um, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a man in his 80s now, but very fit, very smart. And we've had lunch a couple of times just to talk through, you know, I wanted to understand how he ran his team and, and the, the sort of tone and temperature that he uh, used as a, as a team leader. Um, and uh, he was an inspiring man to listen to, uh, a proper old school policeman who you know, who believed that police should be um, the servants of society and, um, and was, was pretty dis disappointed in some of his colleagues who you know, were corrupt uh, or turned a blind eye to things and etc. But he was a man of great principle. And uh, so it was, a, again, it was a, it was a privilege to, to get to meet him. It was sexist, not misogynist. This isn't news. Obviously, it looks like uh, cancel culture, which is quite a phenomenon. And just seeing, you know, the first two episodes, it's quite interesting how it looks at it. But I wonder, how did you find Stephen Moffat's approach to the subject? Well, it's very interesting because it, it starts off being uh, notionally about, about someone who's in risk of being cancelled, even by his own daughter, um, who... Uh, who says if you've stepped outside the accepted norms, then you will be punished. Um, and that's really the sort of flavor that we pick up at the beginning, which is that, you know, the, the Twitterverse um, uh, is famous for being the mob that will find a cause, latch onto it and smother it to death or beat it to death and then stamp on it. And then we'll just check it's dead and then try and kill it again uh, and then move on to something else. It's that cynical um, and that lawless almost. Um, so that's what you see in the first two episodes, you know, done with great comedy and uh, a sort of farcical situation that spirals out of control with my character, who uh, is a respected um, household name, you know, aided, or so he thinks, or, you know, supported by his, uh, his colleague on the sofa, uh, Knightley, um, played by, um, uh, by Karen. And is she helping him or is she hindering him? Not quite sure. And anyway, as the story progresses, it then turns darker and you realise there are other forces at work and it shifts from being just about cancel culture to actually being about the, the nature of the workplace and, and the shifts of power in the workplace. We've seen you know, Madeline being quite powerful, even though my character is more you know, long in the tooth and senior to her. Um, or more experienced than her anyway. Um, and then it gradually shifts as the story progresses and the laughter sticks in your throat and you realize that actually this is a competitive, ugly, dark world that, that she had, she has entered and there are perhaps reasons why she behaves as she does. Um, and it makes you ask questions about yourself like all good satires do, you know, as I say, the laughter freezes and you start to question your own attitudes. Um, 
you know, what would one do given the certain, certain situations that are, that are put in front of the audience um, and what is the right thing to do. And it, it delves into the whole Me Too world as well. Um, but through the prism of this, uh, this uh, very publicly spotlit environment of, of the two television presenters. Yeah.